from Darwin, Australia, live by satellite across Southeast Asia. This is the Australia Television News. Hello, I'm Tracy Chamberlain. In this bulletin, a prominent Chinese industrialist arrested on suspicion of corruption. Doubts over the nuclear agreement between the United States and North Korea. And Nelson Mandela warns against abuse of the newfound freedom in South Africa. But first, the son of a Chinese industrialist with close links to Paramount leader Deng Xiaoping has been arrested on corruption charges. Zhao Bei Feng, 41, was detained by the Beijing Prosecutor's Office on what was termed suspicion of a major economic problem. Zhao was the head of Shogun Concord International, an affiliate of the Capital Iron and Steel Company, and had close ties to one of Deng Xiaoping's sons. News of the arrest followed the sudden retirement earlier this week of his father, 77-year-old Zhao Guanwu. The elder Zhao fought under Deng Xiaoping in the 1930s, and his close ties to China's leaders are thought to be the reason for the company's unusually independent management. The Shogun works were a showcase of Deng Xiaoping's dream of putting capitalism to work in a socialist system. Analysts say the arrest underlines the vulnerability of that system to nepotism and abuse of power. Zhao is among the most senior victims of China's attempts to curb burgeoning corruption among state officials. China has confiscated 30,000 fake computer disks in raids in Beijing's most notorious pirating district. The raids come as US and Chinese officials extend talks to avert a trade war over intellectual property piracy. Piracy of computer disks is a major US complaint being raised in the talks in Beijing. There's now just one week left before tit-for-tat trade sanctions go into effect. With three days of talks between trade negotiators now completed, America says the discussions have been frank and detailed, focusing on protection of audiovisual products, computer software and trademarks. A statement from the US Embassy in Beijing says some progress has been made, but there are still significant differences. China has echoed the assessment, saying there are still some disputes between the two sides. What was hailed as a landmark agreement to remove North Korea's ability to produce a nuclear bomb may be on the verge of collapsing. The agreement with the United States to replace North Korea's nuclear reactors with more modern ones incapable of producing weapons appears deadlocked. The American Under Secretary of Defense, Walter Slocum, says the deal reached last October will not be financially feasible unless the North Korean reactors are replaced with light water reactors from South Korea. And that's not acceptable to the North. Mr. Slocum says the agreement may yet founder, but according to a report in the Washington Times, a solution may be at hand. The newspaper reports that the North Koreans are considering a face-saving plan under which the reactors would be built by the South Koreans but sold through the American Westinghouse Company under their brand name. The Japanese government has approved a supplementary budget to begin reconstruction in earthquake-devastated Kobe. John Shovelin reports the money will pay for emergency relief work. Japan's cabinet agreed to spend an immediate 1 trillion yen or about 13 billion dollars. The money will be part of the current financial year. Another budget allocation for the next financial year commencing April 1st is being drawn up and will be presented to the government before the end of the month. Damage to Kobe and surrounding districts is estimated at 100 billion dollars. The initial spending has been earmarked for removing rubble, temporary housing and condolence money for people who lost family members. Meanwhile, police in Japan say the death toll from the Kobe earthquake has risen to 5,403. The National Police Agency says there are now just two people still listed as missing after the January the 17th quake. In Papua New Guinea, 230 children are dying each week from preventable diseases like TB, polio and measles. Sean Dorney reports the figures on the child death toll have been released by PNG's health minister in the lead-up to the launching next week of a national health campaign. 
Papua New Guinea's Health Minister Peter Barter says 90% of women who die in Papua New Guinea between the ages of 15 and 44 die during childbirth in the village. 38% of the country's children suffer from malnutrition, the highest in the Pacific, and 230 children are dying each week because they haven't been immunised. Mr Barter says the PNG government is declaring 1995 as the year of health promotion and the campaign to be launched by the Prime Minister Sir Julius Chan next Tuesday will focus on achieving community participation in health care. A major environmental program has been prepared to stop the damage to the Mekong River Basin. Following a meeting in Ho Chi Minh City, delegates from Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and Vietnam accepted a $10 million funding offer from the Swedish government for the program. The countries agreed to draw up a common two-year program to protect the environment in the Mekong Basin. In South Korea, a vigil is underway to end one of the most severe dry spells in history. Hundreds of thousands of people are about to run out of water and crops are shriveling under the scorching sun. Some of the nation's political elders have turned to ancient rituals in a bid to end the suffering. It's been months since rain fell on the parched countryside of South Korea's southern provinces. Farmers and residents have watched helplessly as reservoirs and dams dried up and crops died. Already water rationing is underway, soldiers dishing out the diminishing supply. But in the capital Seoul, their plight has not gone unnoticed. <laughs> Elderly members of the nation's parliament have staged a traditional rainmaking ceremony. These gifts are for the gods of soil and grain, participants offering wine and prayer papers and bowing to a pig's head. Meanwhile, in Thailand, another ancient tradition is under threat of being wiped out. The government is trying to stamp out snake catching as it tries to protect endangered species. But for many poor villagers, such moves would be devastating. In the little community of Khao Kiao, 200 kilometres north of Bangkok, scores of snake catchers set off each morning to snare their lucrative prey. They follow snake trails through the fields, dig into holes and snare the reptiles. The snakes are sold to the village headman, Ching Kling, and then within a few days are served up as exotic fare in local restaurants for as much as $15 each. But the trade is in trouble. Conservationists argue that dwindling snake numbers are upsetting the balance of nature and that rodents are being allowed to overrun crops. The government has already banned the export of snake skins and introduced measures to prohibit the catching of endangered species. Additional controls are also planned. In South Africa, Nelson Mandela has vowed to get tough on elements who've misread freedom. In his State of the Nation address to Parliament, he promised to crack down on corruption, crime and racism. Some things never change. The soldiers of free South Africa still march to the same tunes they used to in the past. But this is a day for the new elite, the hierarchy of freedom. As the ceremonial guns fired out across Table Bay, Nelson Mandela took the salute outside Parliament. Showing respect to Distem, the Africana anthem that once represented his people's oppression. Last year it was enough that Mr. Mandela was entering Parliament at all. Today he had to show what his government had done with the power bestowed on it. He sounded more like politicians everywhere. A call for patience. It is important that we rid ourselves of the culture of entitlement. We must not allow ourselves to be seduced into a world of false hopes. The emphasis was on what South Africans could do for themselves. He railed against the strikes and demonstrations, some violent, but have become commonplace. Some of those who have initiated and participated in such activities 
has misread the freedom to name license. So the man whose very name once embodied the culture of protest now calls for stability and cooperation. The reality of power has wrought its change on Nelson Mandela and the ANC. From freedom fighter to president, from liberation movement to party of government. A two-year battle of wits has come to an end as the FBI's top man on computer security has been pitted against the world's most wanted computer hacker. But now the legendary computer criminal faces up to 20 years behind bars. For tens of millions of users worldwide, the internet has also become one vast playground for high-tech villains. Their champion was Kevin D. Mitnick, a notorious hacker accused of stealing thousands of sensitive data files and credit card numbers, who allegedly manipulated phone switching systems to raid corporate computers throughout the USA. He is a more sophisticated hacker. In fact, he had been convicted before and there was a federal warrant for his arrest and he's been a fugitive for over two years. Kevin Mitnick found fame as a teenager when he broke into the country's highly restricted air defense computer system. Even after one term in jail, he couldn't break the hacking habit until he struck once too often, raiding the personal files of Tsutomu Chimomura, an expert in computer security and advisor to the FBI, and a man determined to strike back. For two months, the agency and Mr. Shimomura pursued their quarry electronically, using specially designed software, radio scanning, and round-the-clock surveillance on the internet. Finally, they tracked him down to a mobile phone near an airport in North Carolina, following the signal to this apartment complex, where agents said Mitnick was still on the system when they arrested him. Catching this particular perpetrator was important to the entire net, because unless he was caught, there was no guarantee that he would not be back. With Kevin Mitnick under arrest, computer security experts now have another headache, tracking down other rogue operators, perhaps hundreds of them, committing invisible crimes on the information superhighway. Former West Australian Labor Premier Brian Burke has been released from prison after serving seven months of a two-year sentence for fraud. Mr Burke's release came only hours after the conviction of his Liberal predecessor Ray O'Connor on a charge of stealing $25,000. Mr O'Connor will find out on Monday whether he too will be sent to prison. Brian Burke's release from Woolwillow Prison Farm came at 5 o'clock this morning. But if waiting news reporters were hoping for a comment from, or even a glimpse of the former state leader, they were to be disappointed. He eluded them all. He left in, a, in the usual sort of manner that people picked up in a private car and left in his own way. We don't know how he got out of the prison, but that was up to him. Mr Burke had served seven months of a two-year jail term, imposed last July for fraudulently using his parliamentary travel allowance. Today, there was no sign of him at the family home. A statement from his lawyer saying Mr Burke was naturally pleased to be home with his family, that he was in good health and spirits, and that the separation from his family had been the most painful aspect of his imprisonment, which was difficult and distressing. Mr Burke's release came just 12 hours after a guilty verdict against the man he had defeated to take power in 1983. Former Liberal Premier Ray O'Connor was convicted of stealing $25,000 from Bond Corporation, an amount allegedly destined for the Liberal Party in his electorate of Mount Lawley. I know you've got jobs to do. Give him a fair go. The charge carries a maximum penalty of seven years jail, but Mr O'Connor will have to wait until Monday to hear his fate. As in the case of Brian Burke, Mr O'Connor has been released on bail until sentence is passed. Emergency workers in New South Wales had to battle a huge fireball after a truck ploughed into two cars and another semi. At least two people died in the inferno near Narrabri in western New South Wales. The accident occurred on this stretch of the Newell Highway. Police say a semi-trailer followed by two sedans stopped for roadworks. Another semi-trailer carrying drums of aviation fuel failed to come to a halt smashing into the parked vehicles, erupting in flames. Emergency crews rushed to the scene, but attempts to battle the inferno were thwarted, as exploding drums kept firefighters at bay. Uh, upon a lot closer inspection, we found that there was a motor vehicle at the back of one of the trailers. There was also another motor car truck 
between the two trailers and uh, both trailers and both cars have been completely burned when we've been there. All of the victims came from the two sedans crushed between the trunks. A short time ago, the number killed was still uncertain. Incredibly, both truck drivers were pulled from the wreckage and taken to Narrabri Hospital with only minor injuries. The highway has been closed to traffic, but police say it will be open soon for light vehicles. Anger over the future of Australia's wood chip industry continues, this time with more than a thousand timber workers rallying in Tasmania in support of their jobs. They've warned they'll again blockade Canberra if the federal government fails to make jobs its priority. Timber workers turned out to several rallies around Tasmania for a report back on the blockade of federal parliament two weeks ago. The timber communities no longer are going to be uh, messed around. So it's not only brought timber communities together, but it's brought together the union movement, the industry itself, and the community. And never before has that actually happened. Assessments are now taking place to determine whether forest areas the government said should be spared from wood chipping need to be. And with that process expected to take another seven or eight weeks, timber workers are refusing to let the issue rest. But just because this industry has left their precincts, has returned to its communities, doesn't mean we've gone to sleep. We'll be back if the undertakings and commitments aren't honoured. To keep up the pressure, timber workers are being urged to join a media response network. Spurred on by recent forest protests by conservationists, forestry workers are to wage a letter campaign in the daily newspapers. Vast tracts of western Queensland, bone dry just six weeks ago, are turning back into rich green pastures. Rivers are in flood and some settlements have been isolated for the past month. The mighty Channel Country is funnelling precious water through the nation's heart, rejuvenating the inland. Air Creek and the Georgina and Diamantina rivers are kilometres wide in places. These legendary rivers have been in flood for a month, swollen by waters flowing down from the Gulf Country. The rivers have cut most roads in the region. The people of Baduri live right in the heart of the Channel Country, and the big wet has brought some unwelcome company. So we had a five foot long taipan on the kitchen sink the other day, but other than that, the snakes haven't been as bad as in the 91 flood. The likes of Judy Baker say they don't mind being cut off for a month. Shopping is a bit of a problem, but that's about all. But much to the locals' disappointment, the Dury's famed sand golf course is blemished with grass. Out on the properties, ringers have been passing time refining skills they only get to hone every couple of years or so. Isolated on relatively small islands, the tedium is broken with the odd bog tractor. But as the water subsides, the earth becomes some of the richest fattening land in the country. This plain was a dust bowl before the rains. Drought-stricken cattle were picking at burrs to survive. Even locals marvel at how it changes so quickly. The change of fortunes has lifted the spirits of those who've withstood the drought. Like heaven, hey. Just felt like getting a bottle of rum and rejoicing. <laughs> Further east, the Thompson River is also in flood. The wet has transformed much of the region from dusty brown to deep green. And there may be more good news. The locals say because it's so humid out west, there's more rain coming. To sport and big hitting Australian golfer Lucas Parsons leads the field into tomorrow's final round of the Australian Masters in Melbourne. Parsons finished the day 10 under, two strokes clear of Tom Watson, Mike Clayton and overnight leader Peter Senior. The weather and course seem perfect for low scoring, but looks can be deceiving. Well, he'll be very wary of what he does now. It's just a question of getting it over. Long John Daly had the worst of it, taking a very extended tour of Huntingdale. He dropped six shots on the front nine. Well, if you know, for goodness sake. This is like a, a nature program. He finished with a 79, well behind the leaders. While the American was slipping, Mike Clayton was charging. He strung together four birdies in four holes, finishing with a five under par 68 and a share of second place. Tom Watson had a good day with his putter, not a traditional strength, and raced up the leaderboard. 
But just when he looked comfortable, a double bogey at 15 and a dropped shot on the last brought him back to the pack. He played leapfrog with overnight leader Peter Senior, who is content to play solid, low-risk golf. In 16 on and 6 from the left. Right at it. Beautiful shot from Senior. But the round of the day belonged to Lucas Parsons. The New South Welshman double bogeyed the second, but an eagle at the sixth put him back on track. With a game characterised by powerful approaches and deft putting, Parsons finished 10 under, the man to catch tomorrow. And the shot of the day, Andre Stoltz for an eagle at the par 5 seventh. He's had a rough day. He's holding! Wow! John Bertram's new One Australia has scored its first victory in the third series of the Challenger races in the America's Cup with an easy four-minute margin over Spain. Not such good news, though, for Sid Fisher's Sydney 95, which snapped a spinnaker pole and lost to Nippon Challenge by more than two minutes. San Diego, at long last, turned on ideal racing conditions with a breeze around 10 knots. One Australia had no trouble with Spain after helmsman Rod Davis forced Pedro Campos over the line early. More importantly, the new One Australia speed was impressive. She sailed the course faster than any boat on the day. Tomorrow, One Australia takes on France. And One Australia hardly tested. Sid Fisher's challenge still appears to have plenty of life left in it. Two days ago, with new helmsman Colin Beeshall, Sydney 95 stunned France. Today, she led the Japanese by 41 seconds at the first mark and held on by 18 seconds at the next two. Then the Japanese made their move, downed wind as their strongest point, with Bichel unable to jibe without fouling Nippon, the Japanese took the lead. Pretty rough at the edges, but at least Nippon is in front. Disaster really struck, though, when the Australians started to douse their spinnaker and the pole snapped. Oh, what a problem for Sid Fisher and his crew. Sydney 95, though, has shown she can still worry the more fancied candidates for the remainder of the Challenger series. McLaren has unveiled Nigel Mansell's Formula One racing car for the 95 season. It's been designed to the limits of regulations, featuring a revolutionary central wing behind the driver's head. For once, the overstatement so typical of Formula One has a certain justification. Mansell's McLaren machine, launched today in London's Science Museum, somehow extends the frontiers and yet conforms to the sports complex regulations which were modified to make cars slower and safer after last season's fatalities. But designers naturally want pace, and rules that apply to the rear wing have been avoided by introducing this central wing in order to increase stability and therefore to increase speed. Elsewhere, a high nose, a narrow purpose-built Mercedes engine and underbody should improve aerodynamics and thus overall performance something of a necessity given the way in which last season's Peugeot-powered cars so frustratingly went up in smoke. But controversy focuses on the central wing, a feature on the very limit of the rules. It's not a loophole, it's, it, it's an area which no one else has ever considered exploring. Now we need everything we can get in the way of a grip, and uh, this, this has got a useful contribution to that process. You know, you look at it from the front and you think, look, and then you look at it from the side and it's even more impressive. So uh, I won't tell you what the back looks like. Hopefully a lot of people will be watching that. This is for the moment an especially stationary car. Soon it'll be tested in Portugal prior to the forthcoming season, but not before rivals Williams unveil Damon Hill's new car next Tuesday. Sydney's David O'Brien has won the fifth annual Rottnest Challenge swim off West Australia's coast for the third consecutive time. Hundreds of others were happy just to complete the gruelling 20-kilometre swim. Cottesloe Beach was unusually crowded at 5 o'clock this morning. We think they're quite mad. 453 competitors greased themselves for the 20-kilometre swim to Rottnest Island. The sun had barely risen when the first group left the beach. Swimmers faced a number of obstacles, cramp, hypothermia, strong currents, not to mention the odd cargo ship. Keen observers cited the familiar figure of Sydney's David O'Brien leading a group of bobbing orange heads. O'Brien was pursuing a hat-trick of wins in the event. After four hours and 22 minutes, he did it. Oh, David O'Brien, the winner of the fifth annual 
I've had a tanker and a shark, another used, but this year we had a, a, a Russian submarine, which was a, a little entertaining and it broke the monotony of the swimming time. I can't wait for next year. The first woman to reach the island was 17 year old West Australian Tamara Bruce. This one would probably be the hardest one. Last year was pretty bad, but the stingers weren't as bad, but the stingers made it worse. O'Brien and Bruce each won a thousand dollars. Air racing history has been made with what's claimed to be the first time a jet aircraft has been pitted against piston engine planes in a match race. But the result of the race in northern Tasmania surprised everyone. This year's Sky Race was to have seen jets racing against jets around pylons for the first time in Tasmania. But last minute administrative hitches saw only one jet eligible to compete. The answer to compete against the world's fastest piston engine fighter plane, the Sea Fury. It was a case of experience counting at first with Guido Zuccoli in the Sea Fury. But the jet soon caught up. It's really a case of looking at the next pylon, deciding on the best line, like uh, as you would be in a racing car, and skimming the aeroplane in close to the pylon at the maximum G to keep your speed up. The secret is to be nice and smooth if you can and count the laps. Flight Lieutenant Scott pulled the flight master out on lap five, thinking he'd taken the race, but there was a lap to go. And so, victory for Guido Sicoli. While the competitors have been focusing on winning heats for the $150,000 prize money on offer tomorrow, for spectators, today was a day of entertainment above all. <laughs> Tasmania's Tourism Minister, a suggestion to create an air race series, starting in New Zealand with the final in Tasmania. Peter Hodgman says an international circuit could bring more competitors and sponsors. And I believe that New Zealand and Tasmania don't have to be competitive, we can be compatible. And we've already discussed with the New Zealand government about international marketing of our trout fishing lakes and Antarctic centres, and I think if a race like this started up in New Zealand, we could combine that with, uh, uh, once again, international marketing. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast for the region. Rain forecast for Hong Kong and Macau, a fine day in Beijing, mist in Seoul, cloudy in Tokyo, and rain about in Taipei and Hanoi. Partly cloudy in Bangkok, fine in Manila, afternoon storms in Singapore and Jakarta, a fine day in Ho Chi Minh City, late storms in Kuala Lumpur and showers in Port Moresby. For Australia, a few showers and the chance of a thunderstorm on Christmas in the Cocos Islands, unsettled in Darwin, Perth and Sydney, but looking like being mainly fine in the other capitals. Let's look again at the main stories in this bulletin. The son of a Chinese industrialist with close links to Paramount leader Deng Xiaoping has been arrested on corruption charges. Concerns that agreement between North Korea and the United States on Pyongyang's nuclear plants could be on the verge of collapsing. And South African President Nelson Mandela in his State of Nation address has warned his countrymen that he'll get tough on those who take advantage of newfound freedoms. And that is the news from Australia Television for the moment. I'm Tracy Chamberlain. Bye for now.